And welcome everyone as you are starting to enter to the last uh, keynote of today and of the Migrant Belonging Conference. I have the pleasure of uh, welcoming and introducing Professor Nicolas de Genova for this keynote. Um, as you probably know by now, I'm going to give a brief introduction to uh, the speaker of today, uh, after which he will uh, share with us his insights and his lecture, and there will be time for Q&A uh, at the end. We have to finish in precisely one hour, uh, so feel free to start typing your questions as they come to you, and I will do my best to address them or to report them to Professor De Genoa uh, as soon as he finishes his talk. So, without further um, delays, I'm Domitila Olivieri, Assistant Professor at Utrecht University, uh, but uh, rather than spending time on myself, I'm going to tell you a couple of words on Professor De Genoa in case you uh, strangely do not know his work uh, yet. Um, Nicolas de Genova is a scholar of migration, borders, race, citizenship, and labor. He holds an appointment as professor and chair uh, at the Department of Comparative Cultural Studies at the University of Houston. And uh, more recently, at the beginning of 2020, was also appointed to chair a special committee on race and social justice at the same university. And he previously held teaching appointments uh, in urban and political geography at King's College London, in social cultural anthropology at Stanford and Columbia and Goldsmith, as well as uh, being a visiting professor uh, at different universities such as Warwick, uh, Bern and Amsterdam. He's author of very many book chapters, articles and books, uh, of which I'll name a few, Working the Boundaries, Race, Space and Illegality in Mexican Chicago, he co-authored uh, Latino Crossings, Mexican Puerto Ricans and the Politics of Race and Citizenship. He's editor of uh, Racial Transformation, Latinos and Asian Remaking of the United States. Uh, among other things, he's also editor of The Borders of Europe, Autonomy of Migration, Tactics of Bordering. Co-editor uh, co -editor of Roma Migrants in the European Union and Free Mobility and co-editor more recently of uh, Europa Crisis, Nuevas Palabras Claves, and La Crisis en la, e de Europa, or in English, uh, Europe slash crisis, new keywords of the crisis in and of Europe. Uh, his scholarship and interviews have been published internationally, translated in many different languages, and um, his scholarship is not just international, but also very interdisciplinary across anthropology, sociology, political science, as well as migration studies, as of course you know, uh, considering the conference, border studies, citizenship studies, among others. And I also want to stress uh, his field of intervention in ethnic studies, specifically Latina studies, African-American studies, Asian-American studies, as well as um, extensive work done also on more the so-called European uh, kind of context, uh, interested in the intersection of migration, racialization, and border struggles, and the production of urban space in the European context. Uh, I stress these two points at the multiple locations upon which um, Professor uh, De Genoa scholarship moves, which I think we will see also in the lecture of today, uh, where different spaces and technologies of halting, rerouting, and slowing down migration happen indeed across these different geopolitical spaces. So I will now give you the floor. We'll have more time hopefully to converse, uh, you and me and the audience of today. And the title of your keynote is Migration and the Antinomies of Mobility. Professor De Genoa, please, the uh, floor is yours. Let's see. Okay, well, thank you, Domi, for a uh, very generous introduction. Thank you to all of the organizers for the opportunity to be here today. And thank you everyone for, for turning out after a very busy conference. Uh, I appreciate uh, your endurance if you're here after so many fantastic panels and uh, other keynotes. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, with no further ado, I'll get started. Border policing and militarization, migrant detention, immigration enforcement, and deportation are reaction formations of state power. 
They involve the material and practical organization of tactics and techniques of control, but they arise always in response to a prior fact of human mobility. Rather than seeing these ever more devious and violent formations of state power as if they were purely a matter of control, therefore, it is instructive to situate this economy of power in relation to the primacy, autonomy, and subjectivity of human mobility on a global, transnational, intercontinental, cross-border, post-colonial scale. This primacy of autonomy and subjectivity is true, I contend, as much for refugees as for those who come to be more derisively designated to be mere migrants. Although I will not specifically focus on the practices of the digital, uh, which is of course the theme of the conference, but by this point in the conference, perhaps uh, it is a welcome relief at this point to, to not be so focused on the digital. Um, although I will not specifically focus on the practices of the digital, it is of course noteworthy that these mobilities are also facilitated more than ever before by the ingenious uses to which people on the move have adapted smartphones, social media, and other digital platforms toward the coordination and realization of their own autonomous and subjective desires. If we start from the human freedom of movement and recognize the various tactics of bordering as reaction formations, then the various tactics of border policing and forms of migration governance can be seen to introduce inter interruptions that temporarily immobilize and decelerate human cross-border mobilities with the aim of subjecting them to processes of surveillance and adjudication. Of course, these state tactics are also sometimes deployed to stop and reverse migratory movement, violent pushbacks at borders, deportations, and other types of expulsion notably should be recognized as veritable, veritable forms of forced migration. Indeed, these coercive state measures that impel people across borders are arguably the purest examples of forced migration. This larger dialectic between human mobility and the forces arrayed to govern it reconstitutes these heterogeneous formations of mobility as something that comes to be apprehensible and classifiable alternately as quotes, migration, or quotes, asylum seeking, or the quotes, forced migration of refugees in flight from persecution or violence, which is to say, classifiable as one or another variety of target or object of government. In other words, the very distinctions that we customarily use to mark the difference between migrants and refugees or between migration and forced migration are themselves principally governmental contrivances that serve above all else to subdue and discipline human mobility into legible and manageable categories. There is therefore a permanent epistemic instability within the government of transnational human mobility, which itself relies upon the exercise of a power over classifying, naming, and partitioning migrants and refugees and the more general multiplication of subtle nuances and contradictions among the categories that regiment mobility. Indeed, such a proliferation arises as an inescapable effect of the multifarious reasons and entangled predicaments that motivate or compel people to move across state borders. Simply put, refugees never cease to also have aspirations and against the dominant tendency to figure them as pure victims and thus the passive objects of the compassion or pity or protection of others, they remain subjects who make more or less calculated strategic and tactical choices about how to reconfigure their lives and advance their life projects despite the dispossession and dislocation of their refugee condition. And likewise, migrants are often in flight or fleeing from various social or political conditions that they've come to deem intolerable, thereby actively escaping or deserting forms of everyday deprivation, persecution, or structural violence that they 
that may be no less pernicious for their mundane character. In other words, many migrants made themselves feel completely compelled, absolutely compelled to undertake their journeys and often inclined to understand their own mobility as veritable cases of forced migration, even as they nevertheless exude tremendously strategic subjective dispositions toward their own migratory projects. Hence the labels migrant and refugee commonly remain suspended in a state of tension and ambiguity and may only be sorted into neat and clean distinctions or separated into hermetically sealed partitions um, through more or less heavy-handed governmental interventions. Nonetheless, even against the considerable forces aligned to immobilize their movement or to subject them to the stringent and exclusionary rules and, and constrictions of asylum, the subjective autonomy of human mobility remains an incorrigible force. In my talk today, I would like to consider some examples of how the government or management of the COVID-19 pandemic over the last year has manifested itself in various specific instances of the government or management of migration through state tactics of re-bordering. Now by re-bordering, I have in mind the variety of tactics and technologies deployed by states to revise and reconfigure how they produce borders and therefore also how they continue reproducing them, how they maintain and sustain borders, how they enforce borders and reinforce them. That is to say, I understand borders not to be fixed and objective realities, not inert things, but instead to be the effects of deliberate and purposeful activity, the products, in other words, of work. Hence, the, the efforts of states to manage or govern the COVID public health emergency have become substantially entangled with the ongoing work of producing and enforcing borders and thus on a global scale, the public health crisis has been converted into various spectacles of ostensible border crisis. Importantly, these recent border enforcement spectacles provide important instances where state tactics and techniques of control aimed at blocking and immobilizing migrant and refugee mobilities through detention and other forms of containment or entrapment always remain tentative and tenuous intermissions. Moreover, at times, such interruptions also become occasions for the coercive and commonly violent remobilization of those same formations of human mobility through diversionary tactics that reroute them or through deportation regimes that literally force migrants and refugees into renewed movement, either by returning them to their points of origin, but increasingly dislocating them to altogether new and unforeseen destinations, however temporary. On a global scale, states have largely seized upon the public health crisis as a pretext and as an opportunity for implementing or intensifying draconian controls at their borders resorting to a simple-minded logic of quote-unquote national quarantine to justify violent border closures and often vicious tactics of migrant and refugee immobilization more generally. According to the International Organization of Migration, the IOM, at least 174 countries had implemented travel bans, border closures, and other mobility restrictions to contain and mitigate the pandemic, totaling a minimum of 33,712 restrictions as of March 23rd of last year. With the rising panic around the COVID pandemic, therefore the perceived problem of migration, quote unquote problem, and illegalized migrant and refugee movements in particular, were staged as spectacles of unauthorized border crossing very predictably came to, be, came to be reframed as a contagion of suspect, unruly, unwashed bodies, presumptive carriers of infectious diseases and vectors of an uncontrolled transmission of the ghoulish virus. The frequently uh, racialized equation of border crossing foreigners, in quotes, with the putative threat of contagion, of course, is nothing new. Nonetheless, like the coronavirus itself, 
migrants and refugees have been depicted as a disruptive and dangerous menace that somehow intrudes from outside the presumptively self-contained space of each nation state and triggers a simplistic and often cruel logic of implausible insularity and self-isolation in the guise of public health precautions. Thus the feckless bordering of the pandemic has served to unleash a pandemic of viral borders. Declaring a COVID public health emergency as its pretext, the United States under the Trump administration summarily suspended the consideration of virtually all asylum petitions at land borders, relying on an obscure 1944 statute by which the government authorizes itself to block the entry of other or otherwise expel migrants and refugees purported to be public health threats. The director of the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention issued an order barring the entry of asylum seekers and others arriving at the border without prior authorization to enter. The Centers for Disease Control has nevertheless admitted that closing the border does not effectively safeguard public health. This measure was coupled with the enforcement of a pushback provision introduced earlier in 2019 that compelled asylum seekers awaiting hearings to quote unquote, remain in Mexico, where they were stranded in overburdened reception facilities and hostels until their cases might eventually come up for review. With a treacherous Orwellian irony, this policy was officially named the Migrant Protection Protocols, even as it subjected asylum petitioners to due process violations, family separations, extortion, and kidnapping. Approximately 30,000 of these asylum seekers who were forced to remain in Mexico and were never able to attend their court hearings, furthermore, were deported in absentia. Such measures have not only made a travesty of the very pretense of upholding any ostensible obligation to offer asylum, but also ensured that these asylum seekers now rebranded officially as deportees would suffer far more severe punitive repercussions if they were ever apprehended as quote unquote illegal migrants upon re-entry. Due to the pandemic, moreover, after March 18th of 2020, all asylum hearings were indefinitely suspended in the United States, leaving everyone stuck in Mexico in a condition of protracted waiting and torturous uncertainty with no relief in view. While commonly confined to overcrowded unsanitary circumstances that directly exposed them to a radically heightened risk of COVID infection. Simultaneously, the United States introduced the cynical contrivance whereby some Central American countries from which most asylum seekers arriving at the US-Mexico border had fled would be designated so-called safe third countries for the purposes of deporting asylum seekers who fled violence or, or persecution in neighboring Central American countries. Hence, Guatemalans and Salvadorans would be dumped in Honduras, while Hondurans and Salvadorans could similarly be dumped in Guatemala and so forth. Thus, the United States imposed upon its junior partners in the region to accept and detain asylum seekers who could not otherwise be refalled to the neighboring states from which they often claimed to be fleeing for their lives. Uh, but they would thereafter be deported and indefinitely imprisoned in other countries labeled safe third countries, but deemed unsafe by many of their own ostensible citizens. In other instances, the US deported unaccompanied Central American minors to Mexico, callously abandoning them in a country where they had no familial or social ties and no prospective sources of material or legal support. Likewise, the United States accelerated the more general expulsion of many of any migrants or refugees already in custody, forcibly returning many who were lady, later found to be COVID positive upon arrival in the countries to which they were deported. Thus, the accelerated US deportation regime itself came to operate very predictably as a devious vehicle for the reckless international transmission and proliferation of the virus. Of course, these long and circuitous detours are likely to eventually amount to extended and arduous forms by which migrants and refugees are trapped or contained within their own mobility and have their migratory itineraries significantly prolonged 
and diverted to altogether unforeseen destinations en route. Nonetheless, the probable cumulative effect for many will have been that their actual migrations are interrupted and decelerated, but not halted or reversed. In this respect, whole countries and indeed multi-country corridors of migratory transit are converted into de facto open air detention camps in the very crucial sense that they introduce interruptions and that decelerate the momentum of migrant mobilities, but ultimately they commonly do not necessarily stop or reverse migration. This is especially visible when we consider the detention camps that have proliferated in border zones where migrants and refugees who are in transit must wait to stage their next cross-border movements. Detention camps that have arisen either as statist solutions to the self-organized migrant and refugee camps uh, where people plan their attempts to autonomously cross the next frontier, as in such places as Calais at the French entrance to the tunnel that crosses the English Channel, or uh, Gurugu, the mountain in Morocco just outside the Spanish enclave of Melilla, uh, which have been very long-standing self-organized migrant sites for staging border crossings or more short-lived sites, such as the Edomeni camp uh, at Greece's border with Macedonia during the height of Europe's so-called migrant crisis in 2015, or the camps in Serbia, where thousands gathered in the ensuing years in the hope of crossing into Hungary. But this process of deceleration is also evident in the de facto detention of newly arrived migrants and refugees in remote so-called reception centers where asylum seekers may even be free to come and go and finally are free to leave altogether and disappear into migrant illegality, but are otherwise sequestered by receiving states in remote locales far from any practical means of recommencing their migratory journeys. Frequently then, particularly under circumstances that do not culminate in outright deportations, Detention in its various forms serves to interrupt migratory movement temporarily instead of halting it, operating in effect as decompression chambers. Hence, there are migrants and refugees who in one way or another get stranded or stuck, temporarily immobilized en route, whether they get blocked at border crossing sites or pushed back and contained in makeshift self-organized border zone camps or in shelters or hostels operated by charities, humanitarian NGOs or solidarity organizations who must wait out, who must wait out the border regime, hoping to eventually prevail in their mobility projects. In such examples, it is crucial to see that these standby tactics of migrant and refugee autonomy and their counterpart in the detention facilities of various states border regimes where migration is coercively stalled are indeed not so much simple examples of exclusion in any pure sense, as they serve to modulate the terms and conditions of a kind of subordinate inclusion that is, first of all, instigated by the autonomy and sheer determination of the migrants themselves. And these forms of temporarily prolonging uh, the migratory process through tactics of interruption and deceleration seem to be similarly evident when states deport migrants to states other than their countries of origin, as in the recent efforts of the United States, but also as has been done for many years in the deportations from North African countries to, of African migrants and refugees aspiring to reach Europe to spaces of abandonment at the southern edge of the Sahara, particularly in Mali. Notably, in the context of the deportation dragnets and mass expulsions of migrants enforced in response to the COVID pandemic, the equation of migrants with contagion has sometimes also characterized the reactions of the so-called sending states against returning migrants or deportees, where they are similarly figured as invasive and unwelcome external vectors of disease and viral transmission, and thereby rebranded as unwelcome migrants even in their countries of origin and their countries of presumptive citizenship. Hence, during the pandemic, migrants have been increasingly challenged by a double process of rebordering, a double process of rebordering by both sending and receiving states driven by the false and ultimately futile logic 
of preemptive and punitive exclusion, commonly leaving the migrants trapped in protracted and indefinite transit. All the while exposed to heightened risks of exposure and infection. From the standpoint of public health, of course, this is a plainly self-defeating strategy that merely multiplies the condition of possibility for the virus to spread, but it underscores the extent to which a neo-Malthusian public health rationality mercilessly subjects some lives to a statist calculus whereby those lives are deemed to be expendable and may be disregarded and discounted as affordable deaths. But for those who survive these travails, the renewal of their migrations frequently becomes all the more urgent and necessary as the only reasonable remedy to their failed migratory projects. From the US-Mexico border to Mexico's southern border and multiple borders across Central America to the self-organized migrant camps at Calais to the European Union's hotspot, so-called hotspot reception and detention camps in Italy and Greece, to the ghettos of dislocated, deported migrants in sub-Saharan Africa, to Australia's island prison camps for asylum seekers on Manus and Nauru in the South Pacific. Migrants and refugees' predicaments of being stalled, waiting, strategizing, and biding their time represent a whole spectrum of differing degrees of being on standby. From coercive dislocation and confinement to more amorphous forms of containment, including being contained within their own unfinished mobility projects. And of course, for many, during such periods of indefinite waiting and uncertainty, they're frequently relegated to a condition of protracted unemployment and marginalization even abject destitution. These circumstances are part of a larger process of precaritization that systematically disciplines migrants and refugees into their ultimate socio-political condition of disposability as labor. Their eventual disposability as labor, however, must be first predicated on the material and practical enforcement of the disposability of their lives. This is amply evident in an exaggerated way in the context of the COVID pandemic, where overcrowding and unsanitary conditions directly multiplies the risk of infection and the potential for death. Through such mercenary exercises and putative prophylaxis on the pretext of protecting the public health of their citizens, state tactics of rebordering in the face of the pandemic can be appropriately characterized as a verification of what Ashil Mbembe has called the necropolitics of state sovereignty, for which the material destruction of human bodies and populations remains a central project. The often brutal tendencies of these border regimes have plainly exposed migrants and refugees to an inordinate risk of COVID infection as border closures have interdicted and confined migrants in overcrowded and unsanitary migrant detention prisons with no provision of adequate health care. The most infamous example of this predicament is, of course, the Moria detention camp on the Greek island of Lesbos, originally designed to have the capacity to house a maximum of 3,000 migrants and refugees, long foreseen to be the very predictable scene of an impending humanitarian catastrophe the camp's population had at times swollen to more than 20,000. By September of 2020, this notorious so-called reception center, first created as an emergency so-called hotspot for the supposedly speedy registration of newly arriving asylum seekers in 2015, was estimated to contain a population of 13,000 people. As Europe's largest refugee camp, Moria was overwhelmingly populated by people who had fled dangerous conflict zones, with a very large number of families with children, as well as hundreds of unaccompanied minors trapped indefinitely by the cynical stalemate of a European asylum system that would not process and resettle them elsewhere across the European Union in outrageously overcrowded and squalid conditions, and now in the midst of the uncontrolled pandemic. Under circumstances that remain controversial, 
and somewhat opaque Lemuria camp was burnt down on September 8th through 10th, just of last year, in a series of arson fires. The fires quickly ignited portable gas canisters used for cooking and devastated the camp completely. The fires were variously attributed to either the desperation and exasperation of the migrant inmates of the camp, protesting the severe medical lockdown restrictions imposed on them by camp authorities after, to, after the discovery of 35 positive COVID cases and the more general mismanagement of the pandemic, or alternately were believed to be the wanton handiwork of local Greek fascists exploiting the situation, or not implausibly, both explanations were true. Virtually the entire resident population of migrants and refugees were violently blocked from entering the nearest village by armed bands of hostile Greek residents who also created roadblocks to impede the passage of emergency medical teams and even the Greek military personnel seeking to reach the burned out disaster site to provide relief. Thus, the newly homeless camp residents were summarily left abandoned to sleep and camp out on the remote rural roadsides. Meanwhile, even while Moria burned, Greek coast guards policing the maritime border were engaged in illegal pushbacks on the Aegean Sea, interdicting unseaworthy migrant boats and rafts and forcibly dragging them and abandoning them on the open sea in Turkish waters. The specifically necropolitical dimension of all bordering is abundantly manifest whenever migrants' lives are effectively deemed disposable, whereby migrants, particularly those who are illegalized and rejected refugees, are systematically and disproportionately relegated to conditions that enforce a greater likelihood of their premature deaths. However, this presumptive expendability of migrants' lives is inseparable from the larger configuration of forces that render them to be eminently disposable labor. Here, we must recall that Michel Foucault's well-known proposition of the concept of biopolitics, which designates a modern form of power that responds to a general injunction to cultivate life, to make live, as he puts it, is always accompanied by the concomitant prerogative to let die. In this respect, it's always crucial to not apprehend the necropolitics of borders and migration regimes in a one-sided way as a purely exclusionary impulse, and instead to see the systemic production of border violence and death as intrinsic to the larger biopolitics of these regimes, which produce and regulate illegalized migrants' lives in order to ensure their subordinate inclusion. It is in this regard that we are repeatedly confronted with the apparent paradox but the very same illegalized migrants and rejected refugees castigated as an undesirable menace once they have made their way across these violent and lethal borderscapes are also not infrequently later deemed to be essential workers whose very disposability renders them indispensable to various well-established labor regimes that routinely satisfy the demands of capital accumulation. Even confronted with the ever more devious and deadly reaction formations of border policing and immigration enforcement by state powers, the constitutive force and autonomy of human mobility must nonetheless be central in our analyses of the veritable making and remaking of our contemporary world. Particularly under the restrictions imposed by states during the pandemic, it is abundantly evident that migratory projects and itineraries have been subjected to often violent reversals as a result of border closures, increasingly militarized border control, more heavy handed detention regimes and intensified deportation dragnets. Nonetheless, even under the most repressive conditions and confronted with such cruel reversals, it remains vital to discern the autonomous force and subjective versatility of migrants and refugees who continually recalibrate their own strict strategies and tactics in the agonistic effort to realize their mobility projects. Even against the considerable forces aligned 
to immobilize their migratory projects, which may to greater or lesser extents compel them to revert to a kind of standby mode, migrants' subjective autonomy remains an incorrigible force. And waiting to be reactivated, their mobilities remain an intractable and always potentially disruptive constitutive power. The autonomy of migration is inherently and objectively political, inasmuch as migrants and refugees can be understood to act in a manner that asserts the primacy of their human needs over and against the border, over and against the police, over and against the law, over and against the state. This is objectively the case, regardless of whatever ideas that any given migrant may have formulated consciously or may have articulated. Just think of the thousands of refugees on the march across Europe in 2015, charging one border after another, or think of the caravans of hundreds of Central Americans who arrived at the US-Mexico border in 2018, triumphantly scaling the border fence in a celebration of their defiance. With the idea of a politics of incorrigibility, I have sought to highlight not only the objective intractability of migrant subjectivity within the workings of border regimes that seek to manage or govern human mobility, but also in such moments as these, moments of deliberate disaffection and defiance. I designate this as a politics of incorrigibility, moreover, because it confronts state power and its border, immigration and asylum regimes with the impossibility of changing or correcting the abject excess that its own system of illegalization has generated and sustained. Proponents of the autonomy of migration perspective to which my work has contributed, have frequently advanced the proposition that migration can itself be understood to be a social movement in an objective sense. In the American context, the recurrent mass caravans of recent years composed of migrants and refugees, mainly Honduran and Central and other Central American women, children, unaccompanied minors and LGBT persons, signal an increasingly prominent example of such migrant autonomy and collective self-organization as a veritable social movement. These mobilizations have been a repeated and persistent occurrence over the last decade or more, organized more or less annually by the Transnational Migrant Solidarity Organization, Pueblo Sin Fronteras, People Without Borders, often in the run-up to the Easter Sunday holiday to evoke the Via Crucis, the, the way of the cross associated with the biblical narrative of the passion of Jesus. The caravans provide a model of collective organized migrant and refugee self-protection against the predations of the migratory journey, as well as an affirmative protest mobilization against unjust border and immigration policies. It is crucial to note, however, that a very large portion of these are people fleeing violence in numerous forms, including state repression, as well as disasters associated with climate change, and they aspire to petition for asylum. This is precisely the sort of humble, but nonetheless audacious refugee self-assertion and self-organization that I, with Glenda Garelli and Martina Tazzioli, have called the autonomy of asylum. In this perspective, the questions of asylum, including the stringent and exclusionary juridical provisions for refugee recognition and protection and the hegemonic narratives of victimization, persecution, and forced migration must be rendered apprehensible and commensurate with the irreducibility of refugees constrained but nonetheless substantial autonomy, freedom of movement, and subjectivity, whereby asylum seekers petition for protection and at the same time refuse to accept the spatial traps and restrictions imposed by the asylum regime's rules of the game. The mass caravans of asylum seekers whose collective mobilization defies the customary and obligatory narratives, constructing them as pure victims, repudiate and defy the hegemonic expectation that bona fide and legitimate refugees could only ever be the objects of someone else's pity, compassion, and protection, and instead affirm and boldly assert their subjectivity on autonomy. At the start of 2021, uh, just a few months ago, 
the first major caravan since the COVID outbreak was on the march. Originating in the Honduran city of San Pedro Sula, in the aftermath of the combined economic and social devastation of the pandemic, and then two back-to-back -back hurricanes, uh, Eta and Iota in November, but also as a more general repudiation of the violence, corruption, and impunity of the Honduran state, as well as societal violence and endemic poverty, it was perhaps the largest caravan to date, with estimates ranging from seven to 9,000 participants. Upon crossing the border into Guatemala, the migrants and refugees were met with a militarized response that culminated on January 17th of this year in a fierce assault by state security forces wielding crude wooden truncheons hewn from tree branches and deploying tear gas, citing the requirement that no one can be granted entry into the country without proof of a negative COVID test, the Guatemalan authorities justified their violent reaction on the basis of national security, citing the risk of mass contagion, and also criminalizing the caravan with the allegation that it had been infiltrated by gang members. Then just over three weeks ago, uh, nearly a month ago, on March 29th, the Guatemalan president renewed emergency measures when he again decreed a state of prevention along the country's border with Honduras amid reports that a new migrant caravan might be forming in Honduras, a viral border indeed. If the pandemic has supplied the pretext for this convulsion of reactive and reactionary militarized border policing. However, the deeper infrastructure sustaining this extravagant and brutal response lies in the subcontracting of junior partner states, such as Mexico or Guatemala, to serve as de facto border guards in what is effectively an externalization of the United States border regime across the full extent of Mexico, Central America, and beyond. Uh, for at least the last two decades, the United States has persistently deployed its economic power and political force in order to exert pressure and inexorably enlist and command the compliance of other states across the Americas to marshal their border control, detention, and deportation capabilities toward the ends of intensifying the punitive repercussions for autonomous cross-border human mobility. During the same era, of course, the European Union has pursued an analogous strategy in its own extended so-called neighborhood of externalized bordering from Turkey to North Africa to deep into the sub-Saharan regions of Africa. In these ways, state powers in the so-called global north also conveniently outsource the most cruel violence of their border regimes to more overtly illiberal states that operate with fewer pretensions of humanitarianism and greater levels of impunity. This finally is a crucial dimension of the larger underlying dynamic that the COVID pandemic helps to elucidate. The frenzy of rebordering instigated in the face of the pandemic has served in fact to unleash a veritable pandemic of viral borders an infectious and highly promiscuous contagion of border policing tactics that has spread with a viral velocity and ferocity. However, this viral spread of rebordering has not been occasioned by a random or sporadic sequence of haphazard interactions and exchanges, but rather by the steady, predictable, and largely systematic integration and consolidation of border regimes that exceed the limits and constraints of any single nation state's sovereignty or territorial jurisdiction. This, of course, is not to suggest that these border regimes are somehow not riddled with their own contradictions and conflicts, but it does nonetheless underscore their transnational, intercontinental geopolitical scope. And furthermore, their contradictions and conflicts operate in effect as a kind of convulsive harmonization on a larger scale. The differences that borders produce, furthermore, create the conditions of possibility for the violence, degradation, and racial subjugation of many migrants as effectively subhuman. And this is especially pronounced in contexts where migrants from the world's poorer, formerly colonized countries aspire to transgress the borders of the richest countries. 
Those richest countries, of course, are the imperial or formerly colonialist countries whose wealth, power, and prestige were accumulated on the basis of long histories of conquest, pillage, and exploitation, precisely in those, country, in those countries from which an inordinate number of migrants come. In this respect, we can understand contemporary migration as a key site where the racialized post-coloniality of our global condition is realized and made manifest. And likewise, both the proliferation of borders on a planetary scale and the increasing consolidation of supranational border regimes, which encompass and integrate multiple states as well as various non-state contenders for sovereign power, emerge as complementary sites for staging the unfinished business and open-ended struggles of our global post-colonial condition. In all of this, however, the proliferation, fortification, and re-entrenchment of borders remains fundamentally a reaction formation, responding always to the primacy of the autonomy and subjective force of human mobility and the elementary exercise of our existential freedom of movement. And the transnational intercontinental geopolitical scope of these border regimes is indeed a kind of inverted reflection of the truly global character of these formations of human mobility themselves. This is what the caravans illustrate in a resplendent way. The autonomy of migration and refugee movements repeatedly presents itself as an obstreperous subjective force, and indeed a pronouncedly post-colonial reprise, enacting various configurations of human life in its active productive relation to the space of the planet and thereby reasserting the primacy of human life as a mobile constituent power in itself. The migrant politics of incorrigibility then is radically open-ended. As in the mass migrant protest mobilizations of 2006 across the United States, such a politics of incorrigibility is well expressed in the chant, aquí estamos y no nos vamos, y si nos sacan, Nos regresamos. Here we are, and we're not leaving. And if you throw us out, we'll come right back. In effect, migrants in such moments not only defy the system, but also confront it with its own irreconcilable contradictions and dysfunction. The millions who rallied and marched in those mobilizations were effectively saying not only here we are, but also, where do we go from here? By implication, the migrant politics of incorrigibility boldly articulates the contentious insistence that another world must be possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. Uh, while our uh, viewers are also uh, slowly processing uh, your uh, beautiful uh, talk as well as the images that you share with us and we already have one question from our viewers but I, I take the the privilege of being here uh, hosting you so I I would like to uh, try and formulate a first kind of opening of these 10 minutes of discussion that we have um, maybe starting a little bit from um, one of the core, maybe more theoretical points that I think you make throughout throughout this this intervention, which is the freedom of movement. And I, I would like to to ask you if you can sort of elaborate for us a little bit more how how are we to understand your understanding of this freedom of mo of movement, which elsewhere is you refer to as as an ontological uh, or, or movement almost as a figure of life, and how are we to sort of not understand freedom in the kind of individualistic or uh, individual form and how this instead connects maybe even with a, with a collectivity of the social movement that you mentioned. And I wonder if it's pushing it too far, but if this collectivity speaks also to, to the belongings that maybe also in this conference we've been touching upon, if there is something there to, to unpack more. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, to, to try to be brief um, and succinct, I mean, I do, um, I do contend that when I talk about the freedom of movement, I'm not talking about a right. Um, as long as we sort of operate within the framework of rights, uh, then we are um, 
constrained by um, one or another framework of sovereignty and authority whereby rights are granted. So this is not the kind of freedom that we can understand to somehow be um, enunciated and, um, and inscribed uh, through one or another form of uh, state power or other sorts of sovereignty. Um, I'm talking about an ontological condition of human being. And, and um, while that proposition may be controversial, um, I think it's an absolutely necessary one um, because for me, um, for me, we have to have recourse analytically to, um, um, to the means by which to understand not just our subjection and subjectivation uh, within the existing regime of power relations um, that prevail, not just to capitalist social relations, um, but we have to be able to conceive of something beyond capitalism, beyond the existing regime of power. Um, and the only way to do that is also to acknowledge that there was something that came before it. Right? Um, you know, that, uh, that in other words, rather than be trapped within a conception of power that um, is always all encompassing and subsumes all social life and all social struggles within a kind of um, circular and self-referential framework of subjection um, and subjectivation, um, I want to hold on to certain ontological propositions about human being that give us recourse to the possibility of something that exceeds capitalism, but therefore also pre precedes capitalism. Um, and in that sense, for, for, me, for me, freedom of movement is indeed existential. It is indeed ontological. Uh, it's the exercise and practice of a kind of freedom to move that is uh, integral to human life. Um, and, and I don't think that that means, therefore, um, you know, so, so in other words, what I'm what I'm trying to do is problematize the construction of certain forms of mobility as migration, uh, because those are forms of, of mobility that are bordered by uh, the existing kind of global uh, post-colonial regime of state power. And, um, forms of mobility that in one instance look like crossing the street or going to the other side of town or moving within the framework of an existing nation state are not typically conceived of as migration, but crossing a border is, right? Um, and it's only that because it is indeed subjected by the power of bordering. Um, and so again, I, I'm, I'm interested in retaining a sense of mobility and the freedom of movement as an exercise, as a practice of human, uh, of human life that, um, that is, in you know analytically distinct from the ways in which we conceive of these things as migration um so i'll stop at that might be already too much well yeah there will be much more to say but i'm going to uh give you two questions actually very different from each other but uh we will see if you can address them somehow together um gaia giuliani a colleague from the university of coimbra in portugal uh praises your work very much, and especially your uh, work on the performativity of borders and the semiotic power of borders. And she especially uh, asks how this is connected also with um, colonial archives of, of, of race, which are mobilized or enacted through borders. So she asks, could you please expand on the relation between race and bordering? And the other question, uh, very different um, from uh, Cristiano Giannola, uh, also thanking you very much, asks whether there is any hope that the autonomy of migration and autonomy of asylum can push the category of solidarity within the self-interested politics of modern states in a post-colonial reparation view. And I'm afraid we might only have time for these two if you even uh, can address such complex uh, issues in five minutes. Okay, well, I, th I, I think that they're linked um, inherently. Um, the, um, I mean, one of the things that I argue in part of my work is that borders are a means of production. They're a means of production of difference, uh, a means of production of difference in space, uh, a means of production of spatial differences that are 
essential and elementary within the con contemporary configuration of state power uh, on a kind of universalized modular uh, premise of uh, national um, uh, sovereignty, uh, territorially defined state formations that are constituted as quote unquote national ones. Um, and in that sense, uh, to the extent that borders are essential for producing the difference, uh, the spatialized difference that we call national, they also then are essential and integral to producing um, substantive consequential differences uh, in the distinction between different populations and different groups of people uh, that are you know, constituted as uh, national. And now, obviously, at the risk of oversimplifying the matter, there are ways in which um, some national projects, some nationalisms, um, understand themselves to be civic projects in which there is a kind of notion of assimilation and integration, as in, for example, the United States or other countries notoriously framed as countries of immigration, um, countries that have been historically predicated upon um, you know, a, a notion that they constitute a people or a nation from many diverse sources. Um, and that's problematic and something that I could address separately. Um, but, but, then the, but then we have the more familiar uh, model of a kind of nationalism that, that is premised upon a sense of shared ancestry and common, um, and common heritage um, and common kinship effectively, um, which is essentially um, a notion of nation that is very diff difficult to disentangle from a notion of race, right? Shared ancestry, common kinship, um, are precisely the naturalizing predicates of a notion of race. Now here, of course, I don't take race to refer to anything real, biologically speaking, um, but it's the naturalization and bio biological kind of uh, discursive construction of a notion of difference between groups that gets reified as if it were something real. Um, and so in that sense, race and nation for me are not you know, rigorously distinct analytical categories that they bleed into each other in fundamental ways. So to the extent that borders are essential for the production of notions of national difference, they're always implicitly, at least potentially uh, implicated in the production of a racialized difference between distinct populations as well. Um, for me, again, race is not some kind of objective category that describes a real uh, biological distribution of separate categories, subcategories of humankind. Um, indeed, that's you know one of the preposterous fal falsehoods of the whole history of uh, of uh, racial thinking, of um, racial uh, of racial um, discourse. Um, so, indeed, national differences are frequently racialized differences, um, and in that sense, borders are essential. But to more to the point and more directly related to things that I've said, to the extent that bordering today is, you know, fundamentally implicated also in the continuous mediation of a relation between the formerly colonized world and uh, the former colonial powers, as in the European context, or indeed contemporary configurations of imperial uh, prestige and sovereignty on a global scale, as in the case of the United States, you you have borders doing the double work um, of of uh, reenacting a color bar effectively on a global scale of reinstituted and, and restabilizing a kind of global post-colonial regime uh, whereby the vast majority of humankind have been illegalized preemptively whereby the vast majority of humankind are preemptively prohibited from uh, migrating to Europe, for example, um, and indeed to other rich countries such as the United States. Um, so that is a fundamentally post-colonial way in which bordering today, um, you know, kind of mediates a new a relation between uh, the post-colonial um, 
you know, the post-colonial world of formerly colonized countries and peoples and the post-colonial world of uh, the formerly colonial powers, right? Um, or indeed the de facto, uh, you know, the de facto colonial powers that continue to exercise this kind of inordinate power. That's a deeply, that's a global, that's a global social and political regime of white supremacy historically, and it continues to be. Um, so it means that Europeanness is fundamentally a racial formation of whiteness, of post-colonial whiteness, um, and that the borders of Europe today are implicated fundamentally in, in mediating those inequalities and those violences um, that are at stake. Now, um, the second question, I had less of a clear sense of whether, of, of where the question was going, but but is there some hope for solidarity practices to uh, contribute to a project of post-colonial reparations is the way that I understood the question. Um, I, and I'm, again, I'm not sure that I completely captured the sense of the question, but I think, but I think the simple fact is that we have, as in all struggles, as in all, uh, as in all politics that, you know, that bring together people who are in a, in a fundamentally unequal predicament, um, a set of problems, right? So the relationship between solidarity activism on the part of, for example, white Europeans in relation to migrants and refugees um, who are, you know, overwhelmingly and disproportionately uh, people racialized as non-European and non-white, immediately means that in the words of um, one of my former students, Fiorenza Picozza, who's just published a book, The Coloniality of Asylum, um, we have immediately at stake a politics around solidarity that is riddled with the contradictions of these oftentimes unexamined or suppressed kind of racial inequalities. Um, that there is a coloniality of asylum that bleeds into and contaminates the politics also of solidarity. Um, on the other hand, indeed, um, it's important to rescue the concept of solidarity from this presumptive white and non-white binary, because of course, some of the most important solidarity politics are enacted and pursued precisely by migrants and refugees themselves, right? That some of the most important solidarity work and uh, and activism, whether it takes an overtly activist and political form or expression, um, or indeed is embodied in uh, in the actual relations of mutual aid and care that could be called, um, in a different phrase, the um, the mobile commons, um, as has been developed by several other scholars. Um, that that solidarity takes many forms, and one of the forms, one of the most important forms, is indeed a relation among people on the move and people, migrants and refugees who are actually supporting one another and who create infrastructures of mobility um, in various forms, right? So, so again, I think that solidarity opens up a complex set of questions about a, a variety of different kinds of relations that demand that we interrogate the racial politics and inherent objective inequalities at stake inequalities of citizenship that are also inherently racialized um, in the ways in which people um, struggle around questions of borders and migration. Um, but, um, but, the larger, but the larger struggle, it seems to me, is precisely one that we're still working out in all of these contexts. Um, you know, I don't want to give a recipe or a prescription about <laughs> what, what might be possible, um, but I think that they're radically open-ended and they're sites of experimentation and struggle. Yeah, and I think already through your answer now, and unfortunately we have to stop, and I think also through the talk, this idea of, of pointing towards other configurations of powers or other worlds possible, then indeed we don't have the, the recipes, but I think you gave us a lot of elements to start thinking with, to imagine these different uh, constellations of alternatives, let's say. Uh, I unfortunately have to stop uh, you and <laughs> stop us all, uh, although we didn't address all the questions. So I think the organizer of the conference will um, uh, ask me to end now. There is a last session, I believe.
uh, that concludes this conference. So I think I invite uh, everybody to move to the other session. And I would like to thank uh, Professor De Genoa once more and all the participants and of course the organizer of this conference. And I think uh, therefore I close the, this session for now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.